Whatever was written in former days was for our instruction, so that by the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. The root of Jesse shall come, in him the Gentiles shall hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. We read frantically through Luke's, Luke's book of Acts, hoping he will tell us what happened to Simon Peter, what happened to Paul, but he doesn't. In fact, none of the 27 scrolls in the Christian scriptures tell us what happened to Peter and Paul. Clement was a great Christian at the end of the first century. In the late 90s, he wrote, Peter and Paul underwent great persecution. Nothing more. Scholars know that the two of them suddenly disappeared from the scene in the early to mid-60s. Some scholars believe they were killed under the persecutions of Caesar Nero in the year 62. Some think 63, 64, 65. All the scholars I've read come down to that three-year period when suddenly both of them were gone. Scholars believe Paul wrote this letter to the Romans probably in the year 60. They believe it is the last written material we have from the pen of Paul that he's writing to people he does not know. He's writing to a church he did not found. A handful of people meeting in the capital city of Rome he writes to them, anticipating that one day he will make it to Rome. We believe he and Peter both made it there before they were killed. But this is the last thing we have. This manifest explanation of Paul's understanding of what God had done in Christ Jesus. In this passage today, he writes about hope about hope. Four times he mentions it in just these few verses. Let's take a look. Number one, he begins by saying the steadfastness of Scripture, all that has been written. Now, for Paul, he doesn't think of himself as writing Scripture, of course. <clears throat> he says in one point, I am a Pharisee of Pharisees, the Holy Writ, the 39 scrolls of the Hebrew Scriptures, the Tanakh. He didn't think of himself as writing scripture. He meant those scrolls have given us what we need to know about the God of hope. Last May, Gail and I were three weeks in Italy. This time we concentrated all of our time up in the northern third of the country. One day we took about an hour's train ride over to Parma. Parma is known for two things worldwide the magnificent hogs that graze across the fields there are said to be some of the finest animals in the world. And the mix coming down from the Alps and the warmer airs from the southern part, the boot, get mixed there at Parma in a way that those hams are treated wonderfully well. Some believe the greatest prosciutto in the world is made at Parma. Others say, no, it's the cheese. The grass around Parma is the sweetest and finest anywhere, and the big milk cows that eat all of that grass and produce the milk then have that turned into cheese so that on the Food Channel they tell you over and over, Parmigiano Reggiano, it's the greatest Parmesan cheese in the world. So special that every hoop of it has its own patented name and number when it's shipped out around the world. But Gail and I, though we ate some very good food there, we were there for other reasons, and one of those was to see the beautiful churches of Parma. One of those churches, San Giovanna Evangelisti, the church of St. John the Evangelist, the one who wrote the fourth gospel. When one goes in many of the beautiful churches of Europe, one discovers that they do not have the money to keep up these churches, so they take a few coins from the tourist by leaving the cathedrals and the churches dark. If you want to put in a euro, the lights will come on. But you better look fast, because they don't stay on very long. 
At San Giovanni Evangeliste, one puts the euro in and then hurries quickly to the middle of the room because in the center of the church is a magnificent dome painted 500 years ago by an artist who grew up in an even smaller town a few miles away, but who made his way to Parma, the biggest town in his part of Italy, and became known by the name of his hometown, Correggio. 500 years ago, Correggio lay on a scaffold up there painting the dome. It's a magnificent painting with beautiful blues of God's heaven and God dispatching his son Jesus to the earth, surrounded by a great angelic chorus. Perhaps the chorus that accompanied him and sang to the shepherds that night from Bethlehem. If one walks away from the center of the church, you don't have to walk very far so you can no longer see the dome. The one thing you can see from any place in the church is right on the cusp of the dome. It's a painting by Correggio of San Giovanni Evangelista. If you cannot see God, if you cannot see Jesus, pick up the book, pick up the book and read what John wrote. Last Sunday at 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock, what a magnificent service we had at both of those hours, the lessons and carols, put together first in Cambridge University. The carols were wonderful. Dr. Pencer had picked out some of the most exciting music ever for those two services, but the music hangs on the lessons, the seven lessons that begin with God's wonderful creation, which humans proceeded to mess up, and how God has been working since that time to try to get as many as he can to help him put this creation right again. The lessons, what has been written for us. On Christmas Eve, we will gather here four times, and you will see Mary and Joseph and the baby and shepherds running down the aisle and three wise men presenting gifts. But the whole service hangs on the words. We read about Mary, we read about Joseph, we read about the baby, we read about shepherds, we read about wise men, and all the beautiful music and the candle lighting hang on the words. If you can't see God, if you can't see Jesus, pick up the book and read again. Number two, if you do, you will find that the God of hope wants to give you hope hope, hope. Four times he says this. So what is the hope? Fred Nicholas has written that one morning, not long before Christmas, he and his wife had just had breakfast when she said, Fred, I want you to get in the pickup and drive down the state highway to Interstate 85 and pick up bike. Pick up bike? Have you heard from Mike? She shook her head. Then what makes you think he's going to be there? Something spoke to my deepest heart last night, she said. It said Mike's coming home. He can talk a trucker into giving him a ride down Interstate 85, but when he needs to get out at the highway that comes here, he's going to have trouble catching a ride. Would you go pick him up? Whatever you think, I said. I got in my pickup. I drove down the road. I got to Interstate 85. There stood Mike with his thumb out. He'd been gone for two years. One morning early, he'd shouted at us. He didn't want anybody telling him what to do with his life. He'd find it for himself, and he had disappeared. They would find out later that Mike had had a hard time, couldn't find work. He had bust tables, washed dishes, been a waiter for a time, had actually used a shovel in a ditch. After two years, he had turned toward home. So when Fred pulled the pickup up close to him, stuck his head out the window and said, Hey, Mike, get in the truck. He said, What are you doing here? And he said, Your mother sent me. Have you been coming here every day? No, just today. Why today? Something spoke to your mother's deepest heart 
and told her you were coming home today. Get in the truck, son. Your mother's been waiting for you two years. Dr. Ernst Kasemann, a great German scholar, has written in his commentary on Romans. The hope, the hope Paul is expressing to the Gentile Christians in Rome is that God loves you as much as he loves Jews. That you who've been heathen and pagan, polytheist with multiple gods all these centuries, God's been waiting for you to turn your face toward home. And now if you will get in the truck, he's been waiting for you. Your hope should be that he loves you as much as he's loved Israel the last 2,000 years. Number three, this God of hope will give you joy. Now, joy is not the same thing as happiness. Happiness comes from the word happen. And if good things are happening, we tend to be happy. If bad things are happening, we happen to be not so happy. That's not the word joy. Joy is something very deep within the heart that even circumstances cannot take away. Pam Kidd has written that for years her family lived in Nashville, Tennessee. She said, my mother and father had lived there for many years, and they heard these songs every Christmas about a white Christmas, a white Christmas, and almost never did it snow in Nashville at Christmas time. But when it did... Everybody in town went absolutely crazy. They jumped in their cars and rushed to the nearest drugstore to be sure they had film for their cameras, that there was a battery to make the flash work. They would rush home and put on all the warm clothes they had and get out in that snow quickly because it wasn't going to last very long. And what my father remembered was how beautiful it was, how it just covered everything, how light reflected off of it, how even automobiles move so quietly over snow-packed streets. So every Christmas, he bought us presents to be ready for the snow, even though it almost never came. Almost 30 years ago, she said, my father died just before Christmas, but he'd already done his shopping. And so after we buried him, we tried to have Christmas. There was my present under the tree, wrapped by my dad's own hands and written right across the wrapping paper with his own hand, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. And I knew when I opened it, warm mittens, a scarf, a knitted cap, he wanted me to be ready. When Christmas was over, I took that piece of wrapping paper to a local store and I had it framed in a beautiful frame. When I was putting away all the Christmas stuff, I put that little framed wrapping paper with them. And the next year, when I started getting out all the decorations, I took a painting down from right near the spot where we put our tree and hung Dad's wrapping paper. Put it right there. And if children, now grandchildren, ask, what's that? I say, that's a piece of wrapping paper your granddaddy or your great-granddaddy wrapped a present for me one time. Look what it says. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas because in his heart it meant joy. It meant joy. And that's what Christmas ought to bring, joy to the world. And then Paul says... And if he does love you Gentiles as much as Jews, then he will also give you shalom. Shalom. Shalom certainly is absence of hostility. It's usually translated peace. That's a good word, but it's not all inclusive. Shalom means well-being. Last night when I turned out the lights to go to sleep, I was remembering the weather forecast for today and I always worry about whether you'll set your alarm and get up and come on a drizzly day or not. Six more months, I'm going to worry about that. <laughs> I 
Then I'm going to let somebody else worry about that. I worry about you. I worry. Now, will they come back at 5 o'clock? That's such a meaningful service for those who've experienced great loss. And will they come back and help support those who've had a big loss this year? But I also thought in that moment about people we see in the downtown who sleep under the bridges. It's going to be really cold under the bridges tonight. And I prayed. God, I pray there will be nobody in Tulsa Sunday night who doesn't find a warm place to sleep. Because I think God's concerned about those sorts of things. I think he's really concerned about the poor and the hungry, the needy, the voiceless. Shalom has to do with having a warm place to sleep on a cold night, a cool place to sleep when it's 104 in August, whether one has food enough to eat or not. Shalom. If God, in fact, loves you Gentiles as much as he does Israel, then he wants you to have shalom. Judy Reed has written that she grew up a Navy brat. Her dad was in the United States Navy. She still lives in Norfolk, Virginia. She said, my father was deployed for months at a time. Sometimes we didn't see him for eight, nine months at a time. And my older brother, Tim, was sort of like a daddy to me when dad was away. I mean, he saw to it that I got safely to school and safely home every afternoon. He didn't let anybody bully me, I can tell you that for sure. Tim was my right-hand man. He was always there for me. And now when we're old enough to be grandparents, she said, something's come between Tim and me. I kid you not, she said, I, I don't really know what it was. I, I don't know what I said that he took offense at or something he said that I didn't appreciate, but suddenly we weren't talking. It's been three years. No telephone, no text, no email, nothing. Every Christmas for years, she said, Christmas Eve dinner's at my house, and I've already received a note from Tim's old son, his adult son, that he'll be there, and from his daughter Katie, and she and her family are coming, but nothing from Tim. It's Christmas Eve. I'm putting the finishing touches on the dinner, but more than anything, I want to see my brother. And suddenly his daughter Katie calls me, says, Aunt Judy, you're not going to believe this, but I just hung up the phone with Dad. He called me to ask, what time was the dinner at your house? So Judy said, I had to have a present. Even though the adults in my family have quit giving gifts to each other, we give to the children and the grandchildren. But this was special. So I started running frantically through the house, and something drew me to an old scrapbook there, a picture taken when I was 10. Dad had been gone a long time with the Navy, and finally his ship came sailing in just before Christmas, and the commanding officer decided to reward all the families of his crew by having a Christmas party on ship. Gee, I'd never walked across one of those planks onto those big ships. The water was way down there, but Tim had me by the hand. We got on board ship. The food was wonderful. Wow, the Navy guys eat well, she said. They had great food. They had a beautiful tree. Navy band was playing Christmas carols. It was one of the greatest nights of my life. I, I loved it. That picture, that's what I'd give him, that picture. And so she said, I quickly wrapped it. And when he came in the door, we hugged. I said, I have a present for you. He said, we're not supposed to do that anymore. And he said, but I have one for you too. She said, you unwrap yours. No, he said, you first. And when she unwrapped her gift, it was the same picture. The same picture that meant so much to her, meant so much to him. He wanted her to have it. She wanted him to have it. Gentiles, if in fact God loves you as much as he's loved Israel, you can rest in that hope. It will give you joy. It will give you peace.